This is a recording of a webinar previously aired on the 3rd of February 22 and is brought to you by the North East Lep and Tees Valley Combined Authority. The topic of this webinar is Incor Terms for Sales Teams. Today's session is presented by Ben Bradford. And the session will cover what Inco terms are, why we use Inco terms, why it's important for sales teams to understand the Inco terms. We will look at some of the more common Inco terms in detail and we'll consider what can go wrong if you don't get your Inco terms right. Over to you, Ben. Thank you very much, Tracy, and good morning, everyone. Like Tracy mentioned, today we are looking at the importance of Inco terms with a particular focus on how vital it is for your sales team to understand and correctly implement the INCO terms. So firstly, before we get into too much detail, let's make sure that we all have the same understanding of INCO terms. Well, I suppose the easiest way to describe INCO terms is they outline how the goods will be transported from A to be the, the seller to the buyer and, and the actions or responsibilities of each party on that journey. And by responsibilities, there are three main pillars which INCO terms dictate. So firstly, the obligations, aka who does what. So who organizes transport or insurance, also who obtains shipping documents or any required licenses and completes customs formalities. Secondly, we've got the risk, by which we mean where and when does the seller deliver the goods and when does that risk transfer to the buyer. And finally, we have the costs, which part is responsible for the transit, the packaging, the loading or unloading costs. Now, the INCO terms are periodically updated with the latest version being introduced in 2020. They're updated to reflect changes in modern technology and international trade. Currently, there are 11 recognised, internationally recognised INCO terms, and these work on a sliding scale. So from the greatest onus on the buyer to the greatest onus on the seller. And we can quickly have a look at what we mean by that sliding scale. Now, don't worry, we will go through this in more detail, but if red represents the seller and blue represents the buyer, you can see that as we go down the INCO terms, the obligations, the risk and costs is putting more onus on the seller rather than the buyer. Now, it is important to note that, there are, that these are the headline points for each INCO term. And this view gives you uh, an understanding of how each INCO term varies and the important points along the journey. However, before implementing the INCO term, I'd strongly suggest that you read the 10 articles which provide greater clarity on the key factors of an international trade journey. Now, as I mentioned, this information is split into 10 articles, which are numbered 1 to 10. The A articles, so A1 to A10, provide more information on the seller's obligations, while the B articles represent the buyer's obligations. And for each INCO term, the 10 articles set out the same 10 subcategories, which are general obligations, information on the delivery, the transfer of risk, carriage, details on insurance, the delivery or transport documents, the export or import clearance, checking, packaging and marking, the allocation of costs, and finally, any notices. So before you agree to a particular INCO term, ensure that you've read these 10 articles which provide greater clarity on your responsibilities and where those obligations change hand. This just helps to ensure that the international trade journey and take an extra step to try and mitigate any possible delays or issues. Now, finally, before we move away from what the INCO terms are, it is important that we briefly outline what they don't do. Because it is important to note that um, INCO terms 
are no substitute for a contract of sale and should instead be incorporated in the contract. Also, they do not deal with the transfer of property, title or ownership of the goods, the specification of the goods sold, the time, place, method or currency of payment, the remedies which can be sought for a breach of contract, the effect of sanctions or impositions on tariffs, export or import prohibition or restrictions, and finally, intellectual property rights. So now we have an understanding of what the Inca terms are, we need to emphasize why they are so important. Because without question, it is vital that you understand the Inca terms, which you agree in your contracts. I think when discussing the importance of Inco terms, the best place to start is with responsibility. Whether you're the seller or the buyer, the Inco terms outline both parties' responsibilities in order of getting the goods from A to B, the, the seller to the buyer. Now, it may be that under the agreed Inco term, you have no responsibilities, or you may have a, a long list of responsibilities, but if neither you nor your supplier or customer understood INCO terms, how could you ensure that both parties were able to fulfil their responsibilities? Because it may be easier to think that you want your supplier or customer to have the majority of responsibilities. However, if your supplier or customer doesn't have the capability to fulfil those responsibilities, then that will have a knock-on effect on you and your business. Maybe you'd end up receiving your goods late, maybe you'd lose a customer, maybe your supplier will be forced to hike up their prices. And like I said earlier, the INCO terms are internationally recognised. Can you imagine the difficulties and language barriers you would encounter if you tried to negotiate each party's responsibilities from scratch during each contract negotiation. By using the INCO terms, you have that global and comprehensive understanding which can go a long way to ensure that no issues occur. Because, unfortunately, when trading internationally, things can go wrong, especially when businesses have incorrectly used the INCO terms. So let's quickly have a look at a couple of situations where things have gone wrong. Well, firstly, it's quite a common situation where a supplier is offering to ship goods to a customer and for these goods to be delivered to the customer's address, whether that be their, their shop, their factory or, or warehouse. Now, the issue here is that people are not clarifying the INCO term they are using. There are in fact three separate INCO terms which use the word delivered and we will discuss two of them in more detail later. The problem comes when the supplier becomes responsible for everything prior to delivery, and most notably the import formalities in the destination country. So to complete these formalities, the supplier needs to ensure that they contract a customs intermediary who can complete the import documentation on their behalf. They may also, or they will have to, complete and obtain any necessary import licenses and certificates and make payment of any customs duty or excise duty which is payable. On top of this, and maybe most importantly, is a requirement to pay the import VAT. If the supplier is in fact registered in the importing country, which is the case in most instances, he will not be able to reclaim that VAT. So as a sales team and a company, you may be extremely happy with a new contract you've signed with a new customer. However, once it actually comes to delivering, and in particular those requirements and costs which just mentioned, you find that actually the contract isn't as profitable as you may have hoped. And in fact, worst case scenario, your business may have lost money by completing their contractual obligations. A second issue, which unfortunately happens frequently as well, is when something breaks during delivery. 
Now this could happen in transitive by road or ship. I think, as this picture here shows, transporting goods via ship is not always plain sailing. Or it could happen during loading or unloading. Now that could be loading at the seller's location or unloading at the buyer's location. Maybe it's loading or unloading from a plane, a ship or a train. Now, it may be that you haven't agreed on an inco term in your contract, or it may be that you aren't fully aware of your responsibilities when you agree to a particular inco term. So in those instances, who is responsible for the damage? Are you going to have a situation where both parties are left looking at each other, pointing the finger? This can lead to delays, which inevitably means additional costs, Possibly you may end up paying when, under the right inco term, it would no longer have been your responsibility. It could lead to a soured and strained business relationship. So that's a couple of short examples there of what can go wrong. Most importantly, I hope that you can all appreciate that both situations could have been avoided if you'd agreed on the right inco term and both parties were fully aware of their responsibilities. Now, we've run through that, and I think it's now important that we actually dive into some of the commonly used INCO terms and have a discussion on the pros and cons of each option. So, I think the best place to start is by looking at the two extremities on that sliding scale, which I discussed earlier. So firstly, let's have a look at x works which puts the greatest onus on the buyer if we remember from earlier the seller here is represented in red and the buyer is represented in blue you can see from this timeline that the buyer takes responsibility from the goods from a very early stage in fact let's focus on this point here the supplier's premises now, under X Works, the seller delivers the goods once they place them at the disposal of the buyer. And by making the goods available, it does not include loading the goods on any collecting vehicle. It is at this point that the risk, the cost and the obligations pass over to the buyer. Now, if you just come out of this view here, because I also want to take a closer look at the export documentation as you can see this is blue so it is yet again the buyer's responsibility so they're responsible for carrying out and paying for all the export and transit formalities such as the export licenses security clearance and pre-shipment inspection now the buyer can ask for the assistance of the seller to help complete these formalities but this is still at the risk and cost of the buyer. So we'll drop out that view again and have a look at XWorks as a whole. If you are a buyer, I think you can appreciate how XWorks can have a great onus on you, but it is important to note that XWorks can cause difficulties for suppliers as well as buyers. For instance, under XWorks, the buyer like we said, is responsible for loading the goods from the seller's warehouse. Now, what equipment is the buyer going to use to load the goods? Very common, you might have a situation where actually the seller ends up loading those goods using their own equipment. Now, what happens if something goes wrong, if something breaks at that point? Well, that is at the risk of the buyer. Also, as we mentioned, the buyer is responsible for export formalities. However, this can have a detrimental effect on the seller. For example, the seller can zero rate their VAT if the goods have been sold outside the UK. However, if the seller didn't actually complete the export formalities, so it doesn't have, a, have any copies within their records, how can they prove to HMRC the goods were sold outside the UK if HMRC request for the evidence. So I think it's fair to say that XWorks may not be most relevant or applicable in code term for most international movements. 
you still may find that is the best income term for your business and, and that's fine but I hope that we just highlighted that there are issues with X works which both the buyer and the seller need to consider. At the other end of the scale then we have delivered duty paid DDP which just pull it up and um, you can instantly see how it compares and differs to X works whereas X works the majority of our journey was blue here we are all red DDP puts the greatest onus on the seller in this instance the first thing I want to highlight is the delivery point so let's have a closer look at that the goods are classed as being delivered when they arrive at the agreed destination and are made ready for unloading now that place of delivery could be the buyer's shop their factory or warehouse for example but I just want to highlight how the goods are the responsibility of the seller until this point and that the seller bears all risks involved in getting the goods to the agreed destination. Now moving away from that and let's look at arguably the most important part of DDP, the import formalities. Again you can see that these responsibilities are the sellers so that includes the payment of import VAT and duty plus the administrative burden and costs of completing the import formalities. So a couple of key large points with this and depending on which goods are being moved the destination country may require specific licenses or applications. Now for example let's say you're importing into Great Britain and because of your goods you are required to register on the IPATH system and complete a pre-notification before the goods arrive. This requirement does require a fair degree of organisation, pre-planning and data to be inputted. It's not the simplest thing. Now imagine if your EU supplier who was shipping let's say it was honey was given the responsibility of completing the IPATH requirements. So they would need government gateway accounts, GB URI number and the knowledge on how to complete the pre-notification and that's just to name uh, a few things. So you've just made the job of getting your goods arguably so much harder. Now you may think that as the buyer having less responsibility is a good thing but if the goods get stuck at the border then that's clearly going to have an effect on you. Finally on this point in the majority of instances businesses can reclaim the import VAT if they are registered in the destination country. In all likelihood if, if you're selling B2B the buyer will be VAT registered in that country. The seller on the other hand uh, that's different. It's unlikely that the seller will be VAT registered in the destination country. So as such they will be unable to reclaim the import VAT. In essence, this could be seen as simply throwing that money away, particularly if I said that buyer is that registered. So let's get rid of DDP now. Uh, I think we've shown there how the two extremities do have their flaws, but despite their flaws, they are probably still the two most well-known and commonly used in code terms. But is it, it is important that we have a look at a couple of alternative options. Now, unfortunately, we don't have time to go through each option, but let's have a look at a couple in particular. Firstly, as an alternative to XWorks, let's have a look at Free Carrier, FCA. So you can see the, our journey again here, and we can immediately see a couple of differences when comparing the journey with XWorks. Firstly, I want to highlight this part of the journey again. So let's have a look at the delivery point because it is quite unique to FCA. The delivery can happen in one of two ways. So firstly, when the name place is the seller's premises, the, then the delivery takes place when the goods are loaded on the means of transport which was arranged by the buyer or 
delivery can be another named place in which case the goods are delivered when they reach the named place on the seller's means of transport and are ready for unloading by any individual nominated by the buyer. So there are a couple of uh, options here, but at the very least, FCA goes further than XWorks by requiring the seller to load the goods onto the buyer's transport at their premises. By doing this, we've removed that risk, which we talked about earlier, of the seller using their equipment to load goods onto the transport, but at the risk of the buyer. Now, if we close that down, I then just want to highlight one more section of the trade journey. This time, the export documentation, because as you can see, unlike under XWorks, the export documentation is on this occasion in red because it is the seller's responsibility. This makes it easier for the buyer, but also ensures that the seller has the information they need to zero rate the VAT. So this, that, this is FCA and potentially a viable option for any business who has previously relied upon XWorks. Well, let's now look at a potential alternative to DDP and in particular delivered at place, DAP. You can see from this journey roadmap that the majority of the responsibility still falls on the seller. For example, it's still the seller's responsibility to deliver the goods un unloaded at the seller's premises. However, big difference. The import formalities on this occasion are in blue. They are the buyer's responsibility. So the buyer will need to carry out and pay for all import formalities, including licenses, inspection, duty, and import VAT. Remember, that import VAT, um, which was such a, a sticking point under DDP, because a business may be able to reclaim this VAT, but only if they are VAT registered in that destination country. It is so much more likely that the buyer will be VAT registered in that country than the seller, hence, they would be able or should be able to reclaim that import VAT. So they're the four INCO terms which I wanted to discuss today. I think XWorks and DDP still represent the most commonly used INCO terms, especially for businesses who trade between UK and EU. This may partly be due to the fact that customs formalities is, is still a relatively new concept Previously, you could have moved goods to Rome in the same way as moving them to Manchester, but clearly that is not the case anymore. And as this shows here, it's important to remember that there are 11 INCO terms. So there are seven which we haven't been able to properly discuss today. I just hope we've got you thinking about the importance of agreeing the right INCO term and understanding your responsibilities and acknowledging the repercussions. Right, so let's move away from that and start thinking what should you consider before deciding on the best INCO term for your contracts? Because your business does not only have to use one single INCO term for all their contracts, sometimes it is important to consider your supplier or customer and their capabilities. For example, who can arrange the cheapest transport? You may have a large multinational supplier who is privy to cheaper transport than your smaller business. So as such, it makes sense that they are responsible for managing and arranging all, or at least the majority, of the transport. Secondly, what type of transport will you be relying upon? Four of the 11 INCO terms here only apply where goods are moved via sea or inland waterways. Now, these four maritime INCO terms are intended for use where the seller places the goods on board or alongside a vessel at a sea or river port. Now, if you do move goods via sea or inland waterway, 
doesn't necessarily mean that X works or, or DDP, for example, can't be relied upon, but one of the four maritime inco terms are not going to be applicable or best used when you are transporting goods via road or, or train, for example. So got to consider what transport are you using. Another point to consider is whether your customer is a business or consumer. Are we selling B2B or, or B2C? If you're selling to consumers, then they certainly aren't going to arrange their own transfer, transport or complete customs formalities. As such, this might result in you having to ship goods DDP, which means that you need to cover the cost of the duty and the import VAT. Now, as a business, you've got some options. You need to decide whether you can handle those costs, whether you include shipping charges at checkout from the website maybe, or do you incorporate these additional charges in your selling price? Now, that's for you to consider and make a business decision. Final point from me then, how do we go about correctly incorporating the INCO terms? Well, it's important that you make the agreed INCO term clear in your contracts and commercial invoices. Ideally, it should always be written in this format. So in our example here, we've got the chosen INCO term at the beginning, DAP. We've got the named port, place or point. And finally, this statement should be finished by including the words INCO terms 2020. Like I said way back at the beginning, the INCO terms are regularly updated. So by putting the year at the end, you notify all parties which version of the INCO terms you are referring to. Now, highlighting this point here, I can't stress how important it is to include that named port, place or point. Now, depending on the INCO term you use, the place will identify either the place or port at which the goods are considered to have been delivered by the seller to the buyer, the place of delivery, or the place or port to which the seller must organise the carriage of the goods, so i.e. their destination. It's integral that you are as specific as possible to ensure that both parties are fully aware of their responsibilities and negate the risk of the question marks being raised over who is responsible for the goods if something does go wrong. Overall, I think everything we've discussed today, it's all about businesses understanding not only their responsibilities, but also ensuring that your suppliers and customers are aware of their responsibilities too. Good communication by both parties helps to ensure a smooth journey for the goods and build strong business relationships with plenty of returning customers. Communication. Really, I think that is so important and cannot stress that enough. So I think all that is left for me to do is to hand back over to Tracy, run for any questions that may have come in. Thank you for listening, everyone, and back to you, Tracy. Thank you, Ben. If you need any more information or support, the contact details for both local growth hubs are showing on the screen now.